Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the third in the series of the Lunch and Learn webinar inspired by KMC Building Geniuses. I want to thank everybody for carving out valuable time in their day and certainly to our guest panelists, which we'll introduce here in a moment. The subject for today for course SEN 101, which is part of our first semester beginner, beginner series in this, in this uh, sequence for 2024, is an intro to indoor, or really an intoor, an intro to IoT sensors, or Internet of Things sensors, and indoor air quality sensors, or indoor air quality as one of those sensors for buildings. And then understanding that in general, and then also in general, trying to understand airflow management, and then methods by state and federal government to accelerate adoption of these technologies through a method that the IRS calls cost segregation. And so we're going to try to help you understand these capabilities in general, and then weave them together and encourage you to ask questions. And so our distinguished guests for today are Clifford Milligan from KMC, who's the global head of sales, and also an engineer with considerable background in, in these technologies. Uh, Professor Mark Hernandez, who is at, the, at his core an environmental an engineer, but so much more in terms of material science and geo-environmental engineering and water quality and all kinds of other truly amazing background. But he, he's a practical professor. He's, 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 yes, he understands the theory, but he understands the tactics of making those theories benefit people in the environment. So that's why I think he's such an incredible person to have on this, on this uh, session. Then we have Matt Rader, formerly of CBRE, head of cost segregation there, and now the, the head and officer at BBS in charge of cost segregation and other methods of, of uh, commercial real estate assessments. So what I'd like to go do, first of all, is let people introduce themselves and dig into the topic. But before I do, I want to remind you of two things. Number one, we're going to do our next series on Friday, April 19th, so it's always the third Friday of the month. This always at 12.30 p.m., typically at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And next topic, we'll, we'll be going into building cyber physical security for commercial institutional buildings. And we'll have the Chief Technology Officer for Silverstein Properties, and of course, the Honorable Lucian Niemeyer, who's the CEO of a nonprofit called buildingcybersecurity.org. So I want to mention that. And then a final reminder to say, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we will do our very best to go to those questions which are most topic worthy to encourage the discussion. So uh, Professor Hernandez, I know you like to be called Mark. So Mark, please, would you say hello and introduce yourself? Um, hello, friends at home and friends in the studio. Mark Hernandez talking to you just after a big snow event. So I'm just glad I have internet uh, here under two and a half feet of snow in the last 24 hours and uh, happy to be here. Um, I've uh, been studying microbial air pollution for about 30 years and happy to talk about the technology to be able to measure that indoors. Thank you, sir. And uh, Matt, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, Matt Rader. Uh... As Ari said, the leader of cost segregation for BBG Real Estate Services, and uh, been in the cost seg industry for 25 years now. And uh, so, and Ari and I have have tried to to connect a lot of dots within uh, the construction realm and how things get built and the, the tax implications thereof. So, other things around that. So, I'm I'm happy to be there, be here, and explore that with y'all today. Thank you, sir. And Clifford, please introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Ari. Thanks to everybody for joining us today as well. I'm Clifford with KMC, and uh, I, my background is HVAC and building automation in general. So uh, happy to talk those topics. I'm more of a technical engineer nerd, so uh, hopefully I can contribute as much as I can uh, to these guys as well, but more on the functionality of a building operation standpoint. So appreciate I want to start with a, maybe a technical question first to you, Clifford which I know you'll handle like, like a karate master. And then I want to parlay that into Mark and to Matt, but 
what are the types of sensors that we should be familiar with on this call? You know, so so not just indoor air quality, but what are the kind of sensors that you're aware of in built environments, such as buildings? Uh, well, so connected to the BAS, we always have temperature and humidity uh, are pretty, almost exclusively everything's being done right now. Uh, CO2 is another common one that we see in the space that, that's getting installed almost uh, almost everywhere in every single space. And then we have other sensors as well that, that can, in, that gets installed for uh, CO2 or indoor air quality type things. So PO2.5, uh, VOC uh, sensors as well are, the, are probably the most common sensors that we see in the space. There are a few other ones depending on the space, like, you know, if you're in a data center and you have batteries, uh, different different uh, things like that we can add, or a garage parking structure, if it's a, 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 a closed garage, there's different sensors like that that all incorporate read the gases or the toxins that's in the air that tie into the building automation. So. Thank you. So Mark, I'd like to build on that. With your research over the years and, and also some of the projects, projects you've done outside of the normal academic environment, which sensors do you believe, A, have the most impact on, on in, indoor comfort? And B, so what? Like, what is the impact on improving indoor comfort from, from your research? I'm, I'm not going to just speak about my research. I mean, I'm going to talk about the collective of, sure. of building scientists, academics all over the world, um, mostly in urban environments. Um, and like Cliff alluded to, sensors are becoming better, faster, cheaper, and they can measure more things. Specifically with comfort, we're kind of limited to temperature and humidity, right? The energy of the air around us, that's what we condition. Um, but I'm also going to add to that, and Cliff said CO2, carbon dioxide. And the reason I bring that up is um, CO2 levels more recently have been linked to cognitive acuity. Let's just say that. And that has a comfort to it. We don't like stuffy air. We don't like stale air. Um, and that, that does have a, a, a sideshow with comfort, but overwhelming is temperature and humidity. Um, the other thing about CO2 is if it gets high, we feel that we feel that edge, um, feel actually, we should, I would say we feel dull, uh, uh, when those levels creep up. And, uh, uh, what I would like to add about CO2 is we can use that very uh, that data, if it's time resolved and, and we can trust it to assess ventilation performance. So before we go on to Matt, I want to just go dig a little deeper, if you don't mind, Mark. You know, when you talk about uh, cognitive acuity, so our thinking process. So would it be, and, and please correct me, but uh, is the inference that we, we make less mistakes or we think better or we we have less absenteeism or, or some kind of metric like that when, when we that's manage, right. manage well, the air quality. That's, that's right. And CO2 is linked to ventilation performance and these other things. Those are very difficult things to measure because we all respond to discomfort and CO2 levels very differently. Um, and, and there's a distribution of those responses, but I think the research is coalescing around um, both comfort and cognitive ability. We don't like stuffy spaces. We sense that. You asked me about comfort. Now we're talking about performance. Right. Uh, you know, human performance, so to speak. So I, I was trying to keep it with comfort. Um, but yes, it feeds into that. Yeah. Um, I think why we care. And I'm an educator. I work in hundreds of public schools. And there is no doubt um, comfort is by far the overwhelming issue with teaching learning effectiveness. The younger you are, the more sensitive you are to it. Amazing. So Matt, when you think about all these devices, and I know you, first of all, can you tell the audience a little bit about what a cost seg study is? And then we can drill into the real question I wanna ask. Absolutely. So cost segregation is accelerated depreciation. So when you buy or build a building, depreciation starts over or improve a building in the case of uh, KMC control. Uh, depreciation starts over for those things. And so there's um, a tax benefit to front end loading that 
depreciation. So if it's like the lottery, if there's a cash option and the annuity option, cost segregation is the, the cash option version <laughs> of, of uh, depreciation for buildings. Um, and so instead of a, you know, if you buy a building, instead of a hundred thousand dollar deduction this year, it gets you $2 million deduction this year. And so, um, it, it's, it could be pretty substantial. And so with, and the nuances around in building improvements, such as indoor air quality or, or sensors and things like that, uh, it's, it's a wide range of how it gets applied from a tax perspective, um, depending on facts and circumstances of the systems that we, um, are tackling and, um, the realm of whether it's new construction or, uh, an add-on. And so, um, that's, that's what I do is help people navigate that. So Matt, on the path to going to the question, I really want to ask, I'm curious for, I know there's no such thing as an average property, but if I can be so bold as to say an average property, um, what's the typical ROI when you do a cost seg study? Typical ROI is about 35 to one, uh, value to fee. Um, so, um, so for every $35 we give a client, they give us a dollar and that's on average. I mean, there's, I think my record is about a, uh, 1100 to one, uh, on the high end and on the low end, about a five to one. So, uh, it always pays for itself. Uh, it's just a matter of magnitude. All right. So the question I want to ask, and then I want to build on is when you think about some of the sensors that have been discussed in general here, for example, uh, a, a humidity sensor, a temperature sensor, a CO2 sensor and such. You can imagine them being, you know, one of the categories. So maybe number one, you could tell us which category that fits in, fits into from the IRS standpoint. And number two, have you seen this start to start to come up in your studies? We have seen it, um, you know, under project management, um, where I've, I've sat before, you know, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, things like lead or environment, um, air quality is one of those things. And then there's. Uh, a new thing, and Mark, you might be able to help with this. There's there's a rating system for interior uh, performance, and so that more and more people are starting to to care about those things, um, and only the tax people care about the tax implications of those things. And so, uh, the uh, in general terms, uh, those if it's a second generation space, it has a a 15 year tax life uh, because it's. Uh, it's non-structural in nature. It's not adding to any square footage. Um, and so it's called qualified improvement property as a baseline. Um, so at a minimum, it's a 15 year asset. If depending on um, what systems it controls and the technology involved, it could be a five year asset at that point. And so, uh, and then those things are subject to bonus depreciation. I don't want to bog down the details of, um, of the tax implications there because, uh, you know, I don't want to put you to sleep before lunch. But the uh, the uh, there, there's benefits to that, and the bonus depreciation varies year by year. Uh, there is um, some legislation on the, that passed the House about a month ago now uh, to reinstitute 100% bonus uh, depreciation, which means anything with a 20-year life or less that has 100% uh, bonus, so you get to write it off immediately. So there could be an opportunity to write off these sensors immediately, or it could be a 15 year asset with 40% bonus or 60% bonus, depending on the years placed in service. Uh, and then if it goes away, then it be becomes a, a 15 year asset or Thank a five you. year asset, depending on uh, facts and circumstances. So Clifford, you're, you're a hybrid in the sense that you're both technical and you're also business. And I don't want to be an insult to anyone. And when I say that, when I say technical is your subject matter experts all, but, but Clifford, you weren't always in sales. Right. So right now at this stage of kind of what you're seeing, not just with KMC, but you, you see lots of companies, you know, with competitors or, or peers and such. Are you seeing, are pe A, are people aware of these kinds of conversations that we're having now? Or are these kind of focused on like, you know, the price and performance of a particular sensor? No, quite frankly, I, I, I was in contracting for 25 years before coming to work for KMC. So, uh, cost segregation, depreciation from the HVAC standpoint on large equipment was always, uh, in conversations, uh, but never, uh, down to the individual sensors, the building automation systems itself, 
Uh, so I definitely think that that's, that's a conversation that needs to be had. I know I'm going to be having a more. Uh, yeah, I, I think there'll be some. Ad hoc, yeah, because it goes into, it's pretty easy from a standpoint from a comfort or an energy perspective to pencil a return on investment. Uh, but then you can add the cost segregation and, uh, back into that formula as well to even get a better um, financial outcome for the customer. So that, that's pretty uh, unique. Thank you. Mark, if you'd permit, um, when you think about the different, let's call them uh, asset classes, for example, K-12 to or college slash university or office building, uh, warehouse and such that you've, you've been around, as well as the various government entities, um, I guess my thinking is who, who number really two items. Number one, who, who are who are the early adopters of, of, the, of the, this kind of thought leadership? You know, who's saying, "Yeah, we need to do this. We, we need to we need to harvest all the benefits you discussed." So, who are the thought leaders that kind of as a as a as a vertical or as a as a horizontal Par or as a parents as diagonal? Of young, parents of young children, right? <laughs> if you remember back to the pandemic, the little kids. Elementary kids weren't allowed to get vaccinated and they were the first to have to go back to school, right? We had child care right. issues. I mean, there's societal costs associated with this, right? A sick kid is an expensive thing, both the insurance, the immediate family and the school district because school districts get reimbursed on the number of kids in the seats every day. And a sick day is a cost to a, a school district. So while, while Matt was talking about the building, costs and depreciation and the, the microeconomic of the building and the building owner, there's a societal cost for having shitty air quality. And that's where this can pay back in spades, um, especially around buildings that we must go in, right? Children don't have a choice. Parents don't have a choice. Those kids have to go to school. And you could look at transportation hubs that way too. We don't have a choice. We have to enter the airport. We have, to, and there's right. a crowd. So, Here's where, if you look at the cost of a sensor and, you know, the amount of air quality improvement and the associated exposure risk and map that to an illness, whether it be allergy, asthma, flu, COVID or whatever, that the numbers are, then they get staggering huh. um, when you get a respiratory or um, non-respiratory illness, you know, like an allergy. So air, the air sensing systems and ventilation performance have a hidden payback there that we really haven't quantified and takes a, you know, a sociological approach to economy to, have, to back that cost out. And we're in the process of getting that data. So if I increase air exchange, improve mixing, put in HEPA filters in classrooms, there's hard costs and Matt totals how to depreciate those. And then there's, okay, if I have less sick days, where does that map? Right. And a sick day is expensive, sure. whether you be in an office building or school. So, so, Clifford, let me introduce another vector. What about the cost of electricity? When you think about what Mark just said and, and what Matt can do, you know, Matt is, is on the on the tail end and Mark's on the front end, but you're kind of in the middle. What about the cost of electricity? What about the impact on, you know, for example, having a positive air pressure or having more exchanges with with external air like what, how does that impact operating costs in general and electricity specifically uh yeah it's significant i you know what mark was talking about is is the air exchange rate uh, maintaining that air exchange rate number one first and foremost for safety for indoor air quality uh, but also what happens over time is is uh, maintenance and the deterioration of the mechanical equipment and okay. oftentimes the the oftentimes the ventilation fails and at worst, it, you're causing indoor air quality issues to make, uh, you know, sickness and dilution not happening, uh, or you're having the energy cost of, of not properly doing it throughout the life cycle of the building, of, of bringing in too much ventilation or bringing in not the right ventilation. And we could go on and on about all the yeah. other things. We were talking about fires well, earlier and, right. and bringing well, in well, worse. Let me just let me just ask you and then Mark a, a question jointly. What are the applicable standards, whether you're a building or a school or whatever, or an office building or a school? Um, are there app applicable standards? And if, if yes, what are they? Uh, you know, ASHRAE is probably the, the, the leading standard from an indoor air quality standpoint, but that's more of an overall. But each. Could you break, break down that, that um, those, those words, those, those letters? 
uh, ASHRAE is American Society of Heating and Air Conditioning Engineers. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and they set standards for design engineers, people that are designing HVAC and ventilation systems inside buildings, what those uh, air exchange rates need to be based on the, the space utilization, like Mark was saying, for a kid's classroom of kids or a lecture hall or an office space. Uh, based on the utilization of that, they, they get so many air change rates. So yeah, there's standards out there. Those typically get added on or adopted by local municipalities, though, as well. So uh, the, the ASHRAE is more of a governing body that sets the right. standards. It's still up to the local municipalities and the school districts and the government uh, entities to adopt those standards. Mark, you want to add to that? Oh, boy, do I. Um, <laughs> So there are, you know, call them standards, call them guidelines. Yeah. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is what gets built and how it's operated doesn't necessarily meet those guidelines. So Correct. you can't manage what you don't measure. Yeah. And that's where this comes in. And I've seen it in schools, lots of schools mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, they were built for code. They were built for guidelines. They're operated to minimize energy consumption. And when you actually go in and measure the air exchange rate or the mixing regimes in the schools, and you can do that with these new cost, new gen of cost effective sensors, mm -hmm. what actually is performing in practice and what was designed way back when um, are, are, can often be two very, very different things. Um, and I liken it to, hey, man, you don't drive your car without a dashboard. We're driving our buildings without dashboards. Oh, I love that. A lot of times we do not. Wait a minute. So let's build on that. So the, the data that comes off that dashboard, is that something that someone like Matt could use to say, oh, this building's just gone online. They're now measuring these things. Now I should go in there and do a cost egg study. Is there some kind of you know, regional or national report, reporting of, of all the dashboards? No, there is not. Now, there, I, I would say actually regional. Now, for instance, Boston Public Schools, you can go in and look at any classroom, CO2 levels, temperature, humidity, VOC. You can go right online right now and, and take a look at any individual classroom. Um, Washington, D.C., uh, I think it's Montgomery County School District, just put in 10,000. We just put in 3,000 here in Colorado. We're a smaller state. And what information is power. And maybe, you know, our schools or maybe they're overperforming. We could actually save money with these. And if you do the math, just do it on a school's basis or an airport basis, something that's medium to high density. Put a sensor in a room, cost you a little bit less than a thousand bucks and a subscription to get your dashboard, 12 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. Divide that by the occupants in a school, it's less than the cost of a textbook. And that's, that's power for the building manager, right. for the parents, for right. everybody involved. Right, that's that ROI. Actually, in terms of a sense of well being, you know, so the parent worries less and the, the, the school system gets paid more because there's occupied seats. Well, that, that's the hope. We're actually doing a study with CDC funding right now on that very issue. Oh, please, can you expand on that? I'm sorry, say that. Are you allowed to expand on that? That's very yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, no, CDC gave the state of Colorado more than $50 million to put in sensors and couple them with in-room air purifiers. Now we're looking at the actual epidemiological effect of that. Do we get okay. less absenteeism? over multiple seasons in classrooms with and without interventions, like Cliff was talking, do we meet air exchange rate? Do we not? How much electricity does that cost? We're actually layering on individual classrooms with energy monitors at about the same cost. Okay, two textbooks cost per classroom per year. That's nothing. I mean, Boy, if I was the uh, Surgeon General or part of the, the Department of Education or some other stakeholder, I'd be chomping at the bit to get your data. They are. <laughs> so we're right in the middle of that study right now, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's a contest. The cost of sick kids or kids not coming versus the cost and write-offs of the sensing system. Interesting. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be a contest. Matt, question for you. Sorry, it's go going to be good. So Matt, question for you. He, uh, Mark's been talking a lot about these schools and the CDD study, CDC study here. Are all U.S. territorial, or sorry, are, are all entities within U.S. territories, um, whether they're commercial, institutional, or government, um, are they are they uh, able to use the COSEG method? 
No, uh, if they if they do not pay tax, like a school, like a government building in general, uh, this does not apply to the cost segregation. So it's interesting. So if, I, if we were looking for a logic, for a thought logic or a business logic, then we would take that out of the equation because you know it's it's for commercial. It's any any entity that pays tax. Correct. I get that makes sense. That that makes sense. And and um, Mark, could you expand a little bit more on on what Matt? was saying about, you know, the, the ratings of buildings, you know, like what I know we've had lead forever for 15, 20 years, but kind of wellness ratings for buildings. Is, is that something that, yeah, that you don't, need the people to like Clifford and he does something with it? We could we could spend a lot of time on that, um, but I'm going to just keep it short and sweet. Well, building, you know, the seal, the sticker that you see on the door, GBAC, all those, uh -huh. those are done based on how the building was designed. It is not based on how it's operated in real time measurements. So you can you can submit the paperwork, and I keep coming back to you can't manage what you don't measure. They don't require measurements. They require estimates. How was it designed? How do you think it's operated? And to quote Yogi Berra, you know, in theory, practice and theory are the same. In practice, it's not. <laughs> and uh, that is. Uh, that's the big deal here. And these cheap sensors give us that ability to get to real time. I didn't know that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that. From, I'm not glad to hear that from Matt. But these high density buildings that we don't have a choice to be in, airports, rail stations, schools, they don't get a tax benefit, huh. the, the operations. And that's, that's a downside. So I want to go around in the, in the couple of minutes, few minutes we have left here with one question, equal question to each of you. But I want to build on your your metaphor from Yogi Berra. So the question is, what is the equivalent of hitting it out of the ballpark with respect to a you know a combination air quality, indoor air quality, indoor environmental quality solution with with all the IoT sensors and all the data in, you know, aggregated and, and reporting to a to a, a dashboard that has actionable insights whether it's a landlord, whether it's whoever, you know, runs the property or owns the property. But from your, your point of view, um, what is hitting it out of the ballpark, let's say, in the next year and a half? What, what does that look like? So maybe um, uh, Clifford, please start. Uh, so from my perspective, I think I'm, Mark and I are going to agree as many sensors as possible. Uh, that's, that's as many sensors in the space. Uh, I'm actually a, a proponent of multiple CO2 sensors in the space because the CO2 sensor is a, a proxy of where that sensor is located. Uh, and so uh, depending on where the congregation of the people are in the space, but measuring your outside air volume, measuring how many air change rates you're getting diluted from fresh air versus how much you're recirculating from filtered air, what your filter ratings are, uh, censored on, on all your ventilation equipment, temperature, humidity, and CO2 just about everywhere and all throughout the spaces. Uh, is, it, outside as well, we talked about very briefly uh, in our room coming in about fires, being able to measure the in, outside air quality as well and adjust the ventilation rates in the spaces by actively monitoring ventilation uh, to make sure we're not, not bringing in improper out or you know, more harmful outside air quality into our, our clean environments in our spaces. That was a new term I just heard from you, actively monitored ventilation. So it just might be my ignorance, probably Mark and, and Matt know about these things. Um, yes, yeah, CO2, I, I just call it ventilation performance. CO2 can give you that number. Um, mm -hmm. I, the only thing I'd add to what Cliff says is it's very competitive space now. Um, you know, these air quality sensors, you, you could get them off Amazon. Um, and uh, like anything, there's buyer beware. There's a lot of junk out there, a lot of knockoffs. They'll give you a number. I just call them random number generators. <laughs> a good quality sensor is worth its weight, right? You can get an Apple Watch or you can get a Fitbit knockoff. Mm -hmm. And you, you got to know what it is. And Cliff also highlighted it, it's got to be a good quality thing. They can last about 10 years, a good one. They have to be calibrated in situ. You can just do that with fresh air. The other point is where you put them and how they're installed. They have to be thoughtfully placed, usually near a return air duct. So it's representative of the space. Mm -hmm. It's it's a compound. Interesting. It would yeah, seem like something yeah. covered by some kind of standard to make it consistent, but maybe not. Oh, you know, in, indoor air has no standard. 
Right. That's right. There's no enforceable standard. Not right. yet. Not yet. I mean, no, there's right. interesting. Matt, what's hitting it out of the ballpark from your perspective on this on this whole topic? Well, I, I think uh, to the other points made, I think you know what gets measured gets done, and uh, so there, I think there should be not to not to increase size of of standards, but I mean, I think there should be some more standards, and you know, like Mark said, as many sensors as possible, so that. Uh, so the built environment is a good environment. That, that was Cliff who said that. I'm for as few sensors as possible. <laughs> but what's possible? That's the thing. And we're in a whole new range of possibilities now yeah. with this new generation of sensors. It's interesting. I've seen some of these sensor companies take take um, one measurement vector or, or, uh, or um, signal telemetry and then use it to proxy. Like, for example... I have one that doesn't have a, there's one, one manufacturer out there that doesn't measure people count directly, but measures it indirectly from the other, other, other movements of, of the other sensors. So they're able to take a, take a space and kind of divide by some value. Interesting, right? Especially if you're trying to say, okay, this is a conference room and we don't want more than eight people in here. And now you've exceeded that threshold. So do something. Right. Or a classroom. Right. No, I think it's all good. There's obviously a lot more to be said on this topic, and, and this is a short time, but um, I want to express my appreciation. I don't see the questions showing up on the screen, so what I want to do right now is to thank everybody for their time. So to you, Mark, to you, Clifford, to you, Matt, thank the audience for their time to be part of it, and that um, the marketing team at KMC will be making this recording available uh, sometime next week for, for everyone who is part of the invite list. But unless you have any questions, I think we'll bring this session to a close. Mark, Clifford, Matt. I'm thanks, Mark. Thanks, Matt, Good. Mark. Thank Good. you, guys. Thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed it. Right. Be well. All, All the best. Bye-bye.